Hi everybody, welcome. Um, it's great to have lots of you here already, uh, which is fantastic. So I think we'll just make a start. So welcome to this, um, which is the second in the new series of education webinars on occupant centric simulation aided building design. Um, I'm delighted to have here today uh, Marcel Schweiker, who's going to be talking about the fundamentals of indoor environmental quality and occupant needs. So this webinar is part of the mission of the IBIPSA Education Committee. Um, and the committee was set up with a role to identify education and training needs throughout the building simulation performance community and to initiate, develop and encourage new education materials and methods. And one of the core parts of what we do is to ensure that the training sessions that we offer are available for members and also for non-members. So welcome, uh, whether you are a member of IBIPSA or not, we are delighted to have you here. The format that we're going to be using today is the same as the one that we've used in previous webinars, if you've been here. Uh, so in a minute, I'll invite Marcel to share his screen and to give his presentation. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to put to Marcel, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type your questions in there. And then at the end of the presentation, I will put those questions to Marcel and sometimes there's a few that are more general um, and I'll pop some answers um, to those in, in the text box as well. Um, but thank you very much, Marcel, for joining us today. Um, this is a really exciting series of webinars um, on occupant centric modelling. Um, so I'm delighted to, uh, to have you here today to talk about um, the fundamentals of um, indoor environmental quality and occupant needs. Thank you very much, Pamela. Let me share my screen and then we can go ahead. Make sure everything is fine. Good for me. Thank you. Perfect. So hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon wherever you are. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce um, actually a chapter um, in a book. And I think a special thanks needs to go to Liam O'Brien and Farhang Tamasebi, who coordinated um, the whole book um, with many, many authors within the framework for um, of Annex 79. Um, it was a great pleasure to do all this book together. And um, I think the outcome is definitely worth and I can really recommend everyone not only to um, go through all of the lectures, which uh, will present individual chapters of this book, um, but also to get the book and read through it in detail. So this one, the chapter I'm presenting is actually the second chapter after the introduction. So the first chapter with uh, some content. And as you can see, it's about the fundamentals of indoor environment quality and occupant needs. So. This chapter is about um, setting the basis actually for, for the rest of the books, um, trying to harmonize um, the level of knowledge the readers might come to. So whoever of you is deep into the field of indoor environmental quality, um, you might know a lot of what I'm saying today. Um, at the same time, I hope um, I could still find some perspectives I give today um, you may not have seen or which still provoke some discussions um, or fruits of thoughts. Um, I'm, I have to say I'm not the only author um, of this chapter. This chapter um, was written together with Christiane Berger, Julia Day, and Adeshi Madavi, um, with whom together we wrote this chapter. And um, based on what we wrote, I developed um, this presentation. So this presentation is um, I structured into three parts. Um, the first part is indoor environmental quality and occupants' needs. Then I have a look how we go from indoor environmental quality to human building interaction, which factors um, are influencing that. And then um, have an outlook. I will not go into detail. This is also the part which, um, let's say, the other three have written more than I did. Um, to look more, how is this knowledge implemented into standardization? And um, at the end of this chapter, as we saw it as some starting point for the whole book to, to dive into, we also raised some open questions, which may be answered or may not be answered in the book. 
So let's dive into indoor environmental quality. Um, this figure shows, I think, um, what most of you would probably know. Um, four domains of the indoor environmental quality, the thermal domain, visual domain, air quality, and acoustic domain. And in the middle, um, I have put here the, the interface, which is the connection between um, the indoor environment, um, between these four domains, and the human being. But typically, if we look at requirements for the indoor built environment, um, we start actually not with the human being, but we start right away um, with the requirements and with the indoor environmental quality. So for the thermal domain, we could look at temperatures, humidity, air velocity um, in the room which exists, we want to operate or we, which we want to design. For indoor air quality, we have several parameters for visual um, domain and for oral domain, we have, have also quite some parameters to design for. And then we have some general terms like ergonomics, which might then be more related um, when we go into the level of furniture, but also the ergonomics of the interfaces. And um, a point which is important um, is also the safety against injuries. And if we go and then put the human being inside this picture, um, we see that it gets, we, we get many, many more aspects here to look at. Um, we have the individual person, we have the perception of the person, the behavior of the person and the interaction of the person with the interface. And in this chapter, we started to ask us the question, um, what is the needs of the occupants if we start from scratch, which we should look at. And we based the factors we found um, on a very classic schema um, from uh, Maslow, which is very widely known, um, quite old, historic, one of the comments um, of the reviewers we got, why do we use such an old schema? Um, because it's still um, these days used quite often to when we want to look at um, human needs in general. And this is divided into three parts, physiological needs, safety, esteem, and self-actualization. And I will go through these now um, with a little bit more detail to see what we have in each of these different parts. So when we start with the physiological needs, this is the part where we talk about things, um, fundamental um, aspects we need need to provide to the human being, something like air or warmth. And it's important to say that here we are not talking about comfort. Um, we are talking, when we talk about physiological needs, we are talking about first limits of survival. So if we stick to the thermal domain, and I will do this in the examples I give most of the time, um, one, what we know is that um, the difference of, let's say, only four degree C for Kelvin pure body temperature separates life from death. But we also know that we have um, a wide variety um, of strategies already within our body um, to cope with a wider, much wider range of um, thermal conditions surrounding our body. So through, through shivering, through clothing, um, through adjusting metabolic rate, um, adjusting different parts of the heat balance we have, we are able to um, live and survive in quite a long range. And we might think, okay, why do we then need to talk about physiological needs anymore when we are now discussing um, of future buildings we want to design or want to model um, with our simulation? I would like to respond to that question together with the next two points, which is shelter and safety, because Actually, we could hope that after um, decades, um, centuries of improving our building construction, our knowledge of building design, we would not have to have this discussion anymore. Um, what, how can we provide shelter um, or warmth for, for survivability? But um, things are changing these days. There are new challenges arising, and it seems that um, in parts we are not prepared to that. This is the figure um, from around um, September, October this year, published in Nature, showing um, the latest 
um, global average temperatures. And as you can clearly see, 2023 is um, on top of all of this. Um, of course, we have um, some additional heating effects this year. Um, but in general, we will be facing more and more warm conditions. And we need to talk again, unfortunately, when we look at what is the buildings which exist these days, also about survival. This is a study um, which made it into New York Times in the summer 2021, which defined or which said, mentioned that the combination of blackouts and extreme heat may be the deadliest climate related event we can imagine. And the reason is that um, buildings, many buildings um, these days, they are designed um, to keep conditions in a survival range with a high amount of energy, with high amount of electricity, um, being completely dependent on active conditioning system. Um, and all the knowledge, um, or a lot of the knowledge we have from previous time, how to make um, buildings comfortable without um, high energy use um, has been abandoned. And we have huge um, blazing skyscrapers um, without any solar shading. And if all of these need energy for cooling in summer um, and the electric grid is not that stable, we might face a blackout. And in this cases, in these circumstances, um, it would be recommended to better leave the building because if you don't have any passive shading devices and no electricity anymore, um, it might not be about comfort or satisfaction in the building. It might be for some people um, about survival. So instead of safety, we are creating danger inside the buildings. Luckily, I would say we know how to cope with that. And um, if you do a recent decent design and you know what to do, you will avoid that. So we can talk about other things which go beyond physiological, physiological needs. And if we look at um, the point of safety, um, we have different subcategories um, in between them. So we have points like emotional security, health, um, and well-being. And especially the last two, um, I would say they are um, mentioned in, in many instances. Um, many people now talking about healthy buildings, um, about promoting well-being in buildings and so on. And this caused us um, actually to also think this is now not included in the book because we just published it later, but to say what is health and how do we define health? And together with my colleague Rania Kostoferi, Rania Kostoferu and Svenja Lange, we asked laymen and also experts um, about their definition of health and well-being. And I would like to add this here as a, to see what is our understanding of health and well-being. And I'm, I'm really happy or would be happy if people challenge this definition and come up with their own definition, but to be sure that we are transparent around what is health and what is well-being and maybe also comfort. So the conclusion of our work is here, health within the built environment um, is the ability of a person to physiologically, psychologically, and socially adapt to the prevailing conditions related to the indoor environmental quality. And the most important point is here, the ability to adapt to the conditions. While well-being is the outcome of a repeated feeling of comfort um, elicited by prevailing conditions, again, um, consisting of physical aspects of the indoor environmental quality. And um, from completion, comfort, um, we said, is a multidimensional construct, which includes the subjective perception of the individual and is also influenced by the feeling of control, um, which I will um, address later and which we also mention in our chapter. I would like now to go back to um, the first point, the ability of a person to adapt to conditions and why I believe um, this is important and why, why I like to stress it now in this webinar, even though it might not be that explicitly in the chapter, um, it's implicitly, implicitly in many of the points there. To make this case, I'm going back to um, a model which is used here in Germany a lot um, in the framework of occupational medicine or occupational medicine. 
um, occupational psychology. Um, this model, um, it's usually tricky to translate um, the two words Belastung and Beanspruchen in German into English. So the closest we can get is stress um, and strain. And I hope that after seeing the full image here, you will completely understand what I mean. So on the one hand, you see here on the right side, the wet um, weight, which you can consider as the stress to a person. And then on the left side, um, you see the characteristics of the German, uh, of the person, the individual strengths or the resilience of the person. And depending on this individual strengths of the person, the strain here in the middle, the Anspruchung, um, differs. And um, if you see now the full picture, um, I think it's very easy to understand. Depending on the strengths of the person, the left one quite strong, quite adapted to the conditions for that person, the stress, the objectively measurable st stress has a completely different strain than for the person to the right, which is not adapted to the conditions and the work it has to do. If we transfer that to, let's say, a less graphic way, um, this is um, based on a model also from occupational psychology uh, embedded in ISO um, 10075 from 2018, the latest version. Um, you see that all the influences on the human person inside the building, the workload it has, the physical and the environmental quality, social and organizational conditions, as well as societal factors, they all um, lead to a certain level of stress to that person. That's something outside the person, um, which in many cases we can objectively assess. Then we have the individual characteristics, um, the abilities of the person, also the attitudes of the person towards the stressor, and also the physical constitution of the person. And all these characteristics of the person decide what strain the person will really perceive depending on the stress. And then um, this strain can lead to adverse effects, um, short-term or long-term weakening um, or even diseases. And due to this, these potential adverse effects, um, most of the time, when we talk about indoor environmental quality and also conditions we need to standardize, um, we are talking about how can we avoid these um, conditions which lead to a strain and to adverse effects. And how can we relieve the person from, exp um, from these um, exposures um, leading to an adverse effect. I have to say there's nothing against relief um, relief is nice. Maybe some of you would like to be in this position right now, rather than listening to me. Maybe some of you even are right now in this position um, while listening to me. So it's nice to have a relief. But the question is um, whether it's really healthy um, and leading to our well-being when we are always in this position. When you're always... Um, not being exposed um, to any stressor. Um, science shows that um, for, for many other aspects like sports, um, like food, like nutrition, that your body will degenerate um, to a certain extent. So relief is good, um, but there might be more than relief. And if we now complete the full picture um, of this model, um, of occupational psychology, there's a second pathway, because not necessarily um, do we see that a strain is leading to an adverse effect. It could also be that the strain is having a stimulating effect, and that in the short or long term, the strain is strengthening um, the person, um, either physiologically or psychologically. And um, it would be good if we um, are trying to see um, which factors are really stimulating people and how can we design buildings and operate buildings in a way that we are not only concerned about the adverse effects but looking more at the stimulating effect. And I'm happy to see that there's more and more research um, being published recently 
which is going in this direction to looking more at the factors of the stimulating effect. There's a lot of knowledge that this is not um, just theory, but that also in practice, the human body can adapt to quite a lot of conditions. Um, I have shown here um, the example of um, physiological um, acclimatization to heat, um, a review from the year 2015 from Perriard, where they summarize um, the corresponding effects if um, a body is um, repeatedly exposed um, to hot conditions. I have to say here, um, this, I would say, fast and also um, in its extent, um, large effects is not just by sitting in a warm office. Um, here in this case, in these studies, it's usually um, people who are doing sports in warm conditions, um, soldiers um, or sportlers, sportler um, who are exposed to warm conditions. But there are also studies um, now, um, many here from colleagues across the border from Aachen, where I'm now um, currently being in Maastricht, um, showing that also with mild warm conditions, you can establish some adaptation to heat. And the important point is here that um, these physiological changes um, also lead to improvements in human perception, human comfort, and well-being. So if you look here, for example, at the black line for thermal comfort in the figure, you will see that um, together with the physiological acclimatization, also psychological perception of the warm condition um, increases, and the person will feel less hot in, um, in the same condition as a non-acclimatized person. So this is for the thermal one, but we can see this also um, in general, the capability of the human body to adapt to prevailing conditions. And then there is um, a third one, the notion of pleasure, which um, is not only about encouraging, encouraging people um, towards adaptation, towards being strengthened, but also to have some enjoyment inside. And there's more and more articles um, looking at if we really need these monotonic conditions, which are leading to thermal boredom, a term I first read um, in a book by Lisa Heshon about thermal delight, um, or whether we should try to um, emphasize and look more on dynamic conditions and um, try to see to what extent we can um, increase thermal pleasure. And for those of you um, who are interested um, in this topic, I put down here further readings, um, the two books by Lisa Heshong about thermal delight and visual delight, um, a book recently published by um, Mark Decay and Gail Brager um, on experiential design. And there's more literature also on this effect um, of Alice Giger, starting with Kavanagh in the 1970s, and since 2010, 2011, also brought into the built environment by Richard Didier, Tom Parkinson, and others. So to sum up this point, um, I would emphasize that um, human needs is more than just the relief from the exposure. Of course, it's important to minimize environmental, especially harmful environmental exposures, but there's also a necessity to look at what conditions can encourage people um, can lead to adaptation, to strength, strengthening um, through exposures. And um, hopefully we can go beyond just providing conditions that um, are satisfactory, but also um, in certain extent um, conditions which lead to enjoyment. And while saying so, at the same time, um, it's clear, at least to me, and I think to many others, that we don't know right now, um, what exactly these conditions would be? How long do we need a certain encouragement? How often do we really like to in, have some conditions which lead to some pleasantness, to, to enjoyment in the building? Would this be rather annoying um, when we work to be constantly um, put into conditions which change so much that our body physiologically um, gets into pleasantness? Um, or do we need these 
exposures only at certain times or certain moments. Um, I think that's a big gap we have um, after all these long decades of researching um, what is the interaction between the um, indoor environmental quality and the needs of the human beings, which hopefully we can tackle um, in the future. And this is getting, when we want to look at the design of building and probation of building, there are certain points which make this notion even more complex. Um, the first one is, and um, I have to get, give credit here to um, Gail Weger. Um, I kind of visualized a comment she made in one of her talks. Um, the same stimuli can be pleasant um, and exciting. So um, I usually ask this when I would see people who of you would like um, to like eating fruit salad and believes that fruit salad is could be some healthy nutrition. Um, and most of the people um, would say, yes, um, I do like eating fruit salad and it's very nice to eat it. And um, I also consider it as a healthy fruit. There are of course also some who don't like fruit salad, but that's uh, fair enough. But the question is, um, what about the same stimuli, the fruit salad for a complete week, um, a complete month, complete year, or yeah, throughout your whole life, um, if you always have to eat fruit salad and nothing else, then I think the same stimuli, the same fruit salad, at some point would not be pleasant anymore. At some point, it would not be encouraging you um, and you would also not like it. And we can also discuss whether it's healthy to eat fruit salad year, year, year long. Um, so the same stimuli um, in its quantity um, can be stimulating, can be enjoying, but also can be role, um, boring um, or even leading to adverse effects, depending also on its doses. The next point I would like um, related to the role of perceived control, um, as we do see that in many standards um, and in many simulations, um, the role of perceived control is um, underexplored. Um, it's not mentioned so often or incorporated, and there are actually also hardly any ways to model perceived control. But just to make the case here, I would like to give an um, example of a study I did um, some 80 years ago while I was still in Karlsruhe. Um, where we looked at the effect of the number of persons per office um, on physiological and psychological reactions. And actually, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to look what is the effect of the number of persons per office, but at the end, we found out something different. So in this study, we had three randomized um, conditions. Um, people were either assigned to a single person, often two person office or a four person office. All else was kept um, the same, and we even um, designed an interface um, for the people so that they don't have to get up to open the window to start the ceiling fan, start the lighting, um, or lower the blinds. And um, we wanted to see what is the difference between the number of persons in the office. And what we actually saw is that the main difference between um, the conditions we had was the perceived control of the persons. Even though they had objectively exactly the same control, um, they just needed a mouse click um, to open the window, to lower the blinds, um, or to use a ceiling fan. But their perceived level of um, control, as you can see here on the left side, between A1, the single office, and A2 and A4 was significantly reduced um, with other persons inside the room. And furthermore, we could see slight effects on thermal sensation boats. Um, even after, let's say, harmonizing the thermal conditions um, in these offices, we could see that in the four-person office, people um, significantly found, um, evaluated the room hotter than um, in the single-person office. And interestingly, um, we could see that there are different groups. Um, groups defined by to what extent other people affect their own level of perceived control. Um, you see this here on the left side. Um, there's the green group. 
um, the green group, which between a single person office and a four person office, um, the level of perceived control was one um, unit on the scale from one to seven lower in the four person office than in the one person office. So hardly any change, um, a person which still feels having a lot of control in the room with three other persons inside. But then we also had the other group um, which had a dramatic decrease in perceived control with the number of persons, um, starting at five being when being in a single person office, going down to um, a level of two in, in the four person office. And interestingly, we could see that if we calculate the neutral operative temperatures of the persons, so the temperature, the operative temperature at which they would say they would have a neutral vote, we could see that the group um, which was hardly affected by the persons, uh, by the other persons, the green one, um, also the neutral temperature was hardly affected. While for the other group, we had a decrease um, in the operative temperature, meaning an increased cooling demand, um, talking here about summer studies, um, of roughly 0 0.7, 0 0.8 Kelvin. So if we look at um, this whole picture, um, we see that when we talk about occupant needs, we will go beyond um, the traditional factors we may have to look at additional factors, but also have a different look at the traditional factors. I will skip for time reasons um, a bit esteem and self-actualization, which is actually more about um, productivity, enhancing productivity, enabling people to be productive, um, especially also in the workplace um, through the environmental conditions. So coming back to um, the first figure, um, we see that when we look at occupant needs, we have a few factors more like control opportunities, um, support of circadian rhythm, um, more from the lighting domain, um, but also some aspects about the social environment, which is, um, I would say, hard um, up to, let's say, so far impossible to be implemented into building performance simulation. But also we might now have a different view on what exactly should we look at when looking at temperature. And when we now look at occupant needs, um, we need to add um, a second component, which is that these occupant needs and therefore also the requirements for the indoor built environment is dependent on the place and the situation a person is in. Um, what activity are people doing? Which type of building are they? What season do we, ha do we have? Um, which time of the day is it? And also person-based. Um, what are the aspirations of the persons, the expectations of the persons? Um, what is the personality, the attitudes, um, and also the physiological and health status of the person will influence um, their needs, the weighting of their needs, and therefore also the requirements for indoor built environment. So overall, quite um, a complex relationship. To give just a small example for um, personal variants, um, we summarized that with um, colleagues Gesche Hübner, Boris Kingmer, um, Big Kama, and um, Hanna Palubinski um, some years ago, um, just for the thermal um, aspects, we sum up the inferences, and we also put some effort in, in modeling. So here, together with uh, Boris Kingmer, we used his uh, thermoneutral zone model. We looked at what is the operative temperature in the center of the thermoneutral zone, so where the body is in a neutral state. And um, we can see here in this picture um, between person variants. So for example, between an average female and an average male, we can see um, a difference in the conditions preferred but we can also see a within person variance um, by the time of the day due to the fluctuation of the body cure temperature. Um, you see that uh, in the morning hours, um, rather a little bit lower temperatures are exactly at the um, center of the thermoneutral zone, while towards the afternoon, a bit higher temperatures are there. So we increase complexity if we want to um, include all these factors. And a last point with this respect, um, 
these requirements for in the built environment, they then lead to requirements for the building elements. We have like static building elements from the building um, envelope and the building structure, but also um, the interfaces and the active building systems. And this is the way this figure is um, also in our chapter. Um, we see that there are um, lines connecting um, these building elements to very different dimensions. So human needs are not only individual and changing with the time, but they are also multidimensional, even if we may not um, think or design for it. A very simple examples. Um, I like to um, show this image as it shows um, how solutions um, need to be assessed also multi-dimensionally. Because if you think of, um, try to get the, the laser pointer now, um, think of a person behind this window here. Um, if this is a person like me who would really like to sleep with an open window at night time, and this might be my bedroom behind that, then um, I have a problem because the relief of the other persons, of all my neighbors, um, is not only leading um, to some um, thermal relief for them, but they will have the exhaust heat is entering my window and also with another domain, the noise from the devices is leading to me, likely deciding, even though I would like to laugh, to sleep with an open window, um, that this might be not the best thing for me to have a good sleep quality under these conditions. Good, coming now to the second part, um, which will be shorter than the first one. Um, the second part of this um, first um, Part of this chapter is about, um, let's say, what is influencing the step from environmental conditions on the one side to human building interaction, which we might want to model and want to consider um, in building performance simulation. And you see that from the environmental conditions, um, we go to sensory information, then the interpretation of the signals, and then the human building interaction. And in each of these steps, we have something um, in between. And I will focus now only on this step um, between sensory information and the interpretation of the signals to give you also here one example um, of the complexity um, behind it and also of maybe some food for thought, um, what we still need to investigate further or consider. Um, this is based on the scale study, um, a study I was leading a couple of years ago. And as many of you might know, is that when we talk about thermal conditions and standards for thermal conditions, um, be it the um, ASHRAE standard, be it the ISO 7730, all of these um, which give you certain conditions um, based on the PMV model or the adaptive model, all of them um, are based on a single question um, asked to, to many, many people, how do you feel right now? And the response options are the seven points from ASHRAE, from cold to hot. And what's done so far, this is a sensation which has no irradiation of the person, um, is that it's usually interpreted, um, which is clearly see in this relationship between PMV and PPD, that if a person states one of the three middle votes, then the person is satisfied. If outside of the three middle votes, the person is dissatisfied. And together with many, many colleagues, um, we asked, um, is this really the case? Can we, can we say so? Um, this sensation, is this really mapped to a satisfaction value in this way um, so clearly? So we designed a bit atypical questioner um, in, with, in the field of thermal uh, comfort. And we asked people not how do you feel right now? We asked um, when I feel cold, this is, and gave them the task to, to draw this um, on a line. So to show this how this would look like, we would have this line from comfortable to extremely uncomfortable um, in a printed version, 10 centimeters long. 
Um, and then the persons were asked, okay, um, A, cold, where do you put it on this line? Um, for example, close to extremely uncomfortable. B, cool, might be a bit more comfortable. And if you do this for all the seven um, labels, you get a picture um, here for this person, for example, D, neither warm nor cool would be the most comfortable, followed by slightly warm, slightly cool. And we did this task um, all over the world. Well, we didn't manage all over the world, but I would say we did a um, good job in covering 32 countries and 59 cities where we gave this task um, to university students at the end of the lecture when they were adapted to the room conditions. And you see here the red dots is the dots of the cities um, where this questioner was applied. And the blue dot is um, where the country or the, the towns, the people who participated in the study came from. And in total with this procedure, um, low cost um, collaborative work um, between more than 90 researchers in the field of thermal comfort, we collected um, more than 8,000 data points. Then we anal analyzed them, um, and this is how the analysis um, would look like. Sorry, the left part is a bit cut off. So basically, you see here on the x-axis um, the different votes. Um, you see here in neutral, um, the box plot closest to comfortable. Then we have slightly cool, slightly warm being um, the next ones, and so on up to cold and hot um, being furthest away from comfortable. So you could say, okay, this looks exactly um, how the predictions are. The middle three roads um, are perceived as comfortable and the other ones are slightly uncom uncomfortable or beyond. Um, I wouldn't show this if I wouldn't have a different answer to that because this is only one group um, which came out in a statistical cluster analysis. Uh, this is subgroup two, so the numbering is by chance, consisting of less than one fourth um, of the respondents. If you look at all groups, um, you see that we have quite a variety how people um, map these sensations to um, the comfortable conditions. Um, you see here subgroup one, which is more inclined to say, okay, slightly warm, warm is something which where I would feel comfortable. Subgroup four, which is more towards slightly cool, even cold would be something very comfortable. And by additional responses we had from the person, um, we could also see that um, the climatic region um, people come from, but also the season um, people are currently in um, has an effect to which of the sensation is perceived as comfortable or more towards uncomfortable. So, um, you see that in this point between um, sensory information and the interpretation, interpretation of signals, um, we have personal factors, context, contextual factors, which influence how we interpret the signal. And just to brief, give a very brief glimpse um, on this one, on the interpretation of signal to human behavior, um, that's actually um, outcome of the previous annex, um, the previous annex book from annex 69, um, where we had a chapter where we summarized all the influences on occupant behavior um, together um, with certain colleagues. And I will not go into detail here, but you can see that also here, we have quite a number of um, influences. So um, summarizing this part um, there, Again, we have quite a complex relationship between the indoor environment and the human being. To just um, give a small glimpse what you would also expect when you read this full chapter, um, the second part of the chapter is about standardization, which was um, mostly um, driven forward by Adeshi Madavi and Christiane Berger, which looked at common practices regarding standards, um, looked at limits, thresholds, ranges, um, and zones, um, and um, how they are defined. And I think a cure part of this um, piece um, of the chapter is um, to question what was the scientific foundations, um, the parts which I introduced, the, the large body of knowledge 
we have on the relationship between indoor environmental quality and um, the human being. What of this evidence can we find um, in engineering guidance or in standardization? So the questions which are addressed here, given the inherent complexity, um, which I introduced, um, can the standards rely on a comparably objective scientific knowledge and do the IQ related standards provide clear and traceable references um, to whatever scientific foundation they refer to? Um, I will not give the answer now. Um, I will refer to, to the book. Um, and the last part's about measurements, constructs, and about the limits of limits. In the third part um, of the chapter, um, we address um, a certain number of open questions, which the four, are, the four of us believe um, they, they would deserve more thoughts, um, especially also in relation um, to how can we bring these aspects um, into building simulation um, modeling but also just in, in general to building design and operation. The first one um, is the point of adaptive thermal comfort of perceived control, um, also personalized and control, which I um, partly um, introduced as at least the aspect of perceived control. Um, and the question, um, how can we better account for adaptation? Um, adaptation both physiologically, but also psychological adaptation and, and also how can we account for non-physical factors like the atmosphere, um, like aspects like perceived control or personal control in model. Um, small star here to one approach which I introduced some years ago, um, but there's definitely a lot of space to, to improve this. Then we have this general balance between manual um, and automated control um, which we can also need to tackle more. And I see Pamela showing her face, so I will, I'm close to finishing. There are only two more um, bullet points on this slide, which is the last one before the summary. Um, the second open question is um, the effect um, of occupant interactions with building controls um, on energy use in real test bed building scenarios. So the interaction with, with, between indoor environmental quality, energy and human building interactions, and especially how to design buildings and interfaces to create and foster informed interactions while also educating engaging occupants as needed, which reflects also a bit at the balance between manual and automated control in the framework of perceived control. And the last point is the interaction among indoor environmental quality domains. The example I've gave with the active air conditioning system which is leading to relief of one person, but leading to thermal stress um, and also acoustic stress for another person. And then the question, how do we prioritize different IQ domains in design and operation? So in summary, I was reflecting um, on the occupant needs as we do in the chapter, the relation to environmental quality and building elements. Then we had a look at this process from the environmental quality to human building interaction and the multitude of the influences at each stage and um, briefly went through standardization and open questions. And with that, I hope um, our chapter and also my talk can lay the foundation for other chapters, but also other webinars which will um, follow up um, like chapter three on how to incorporate the occupant perspective into the building design process, chapter four ways to obtain the occupant perspective and needs to inform design, and chapter nine where Julia Day, one of the co-authors also of this chapter, will go into much more detail on control and interfaces. And with that, I thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Marcel. That's been fascinating. Um, such a complex subject um, when you start to look at it. Um, we have a number of questions in the chat, so I'll move straight on to those. Uh, the first one is considering the energy used and the comfort of the indoor environment. Um, what do you think is the optimal control strategy? Do you have any suggestions? That's a very tricky question. I think um, what is the essence of my talk that there's likely no optimal control strategy for everyone. Um, as we have so many influences um, from the individual being, um, from the building itself, 
um, what possibilities we have to control and not. Um, I think um, I, I kind of doubt, but I would be happy if I'm um, challenged here. Um, I doubt that there's a single optimal strategy. I think um, a way forward would be to, to look at strategies which sort of combine, let's say, basic requirements um, for, let's say, the majority of people, but then give individual persons the possibility to adjust the conditions um, to their own individual needs. Um, this does not have to be very technical. We can just talk about clothing here. If we look at the thermal domain, allowing people to put on the sweater or relieve a sweater um, in certain conditions could be part of the control strategy. Um, but could go into, which is then the actual work of another annex, the Annex 87, which is looking at personal comfort systems, which then give people opportunity um, within a larger space, which is conditioned to um, a level that is meeting the requirements of many people, um, the opportunity to um, yeah, adjust their own conditions to themselves. So if I would have to say it shortly, I would say the optimal control, um, the, con the optimal control um, algorithm or so is something which gives people still the opportunity to adjust the conditions um, to their individual needs. Thank you. And somewhat related to that, can you give us a view of the best ways of modeling perceived control in the human behavior modeling? Um, and the question there also asks if the theory of planned behavior is part of that. Yeah, um, there are there is some literature, um, Simona Docker, Tianjin Hong, which will also be Tianjin Hong, I think, in one of the other um, webinars here, which um, looked at the theory of planned behavior in relation to um, occupant behavioral modeling. Um, I think. This is a very interesting approach and um, definitely deserves more work. Right now, let's say for occupant behavioral modeling, I haven't seen, but I also haven't searched for it specifically, um, a model which tries to incorporate perceived control. Um, I have done myself um, an extension of the PMV model um, in combination with the adaptive model which includes perceived control to model thermal perception. Um, I think for occupant behavior, um, it would be, if I haven't missed that paper, paper um, it would be interesting to see um, whether we can obtain first data also to create these models um, in order to be able to um, say, what is the difference in the behavior of the people when they have a higher level of perceived control or a lower level, um, does this only affect the perception or do they really behave differently? Yeah, thank you. Lots to think about there. Um, so can I ask what you think the characteristics a resilient indoor environment should possess would be? Mm -hmm. If you could just summarize that briefly. <laughs> yeah, I could talk. Uh long about this um, word of resilience alone. Um, I think when we talk about resilience, I would like to introduce more the term of human building resilience, because um, if we talk about the resilience of the building alone, um, we might get into a point where the building is, let's say, theoretically, objectively very resilient. Um, which might mean that if we stick to the thermal domain, whatever, whatever happens outside the building does not affect the inside of the building. And um, we did um, a lot of technical effort to um, reach that, which I think is questionable whether this technical effort is justified. But at the same time, we might forget um, the notion I was mentioning that people um, might need more dynamic conditions, um, need exposure to, to, to little warmer conditions, um, maybe even outside the, the actual comfort range at some time in order to physiological and psychologically um, adapt to these conditions. So um, in simple terms, um, I think um, a simple 
not not in terms of um, like simplified, but um, a robust design, in my opinion, um, would be a rather less complex design. Mm -hmm. um, the more complexity we bring into it, the more can get wrong. Um, so if we manage to have robust design, which starts from architectural thoughts on passive measures, which do not require a lot of maintenance, um, then I think we go into the direction of resilience of the building. Um, and if we then consider also the human being and the needs of the human being to um, have certain exposures, um, then this could be a way forward. Thank you. I think we've got time for one final question. Um, I'm afraid that does mean we'll leave a few unanswered, but perhaps we can continue the discussion um, on LinkedIn and um, and other methods as well. Um, do you know if the different personas might have different perceptions about their human building interactions along the range of the three dimensions you mentioned earlier? Mm. Well, I, I haven't done a study on it, but I'm pretty sure that there are um, different personas and different dimensions. Um, we had a look, this was also during my time in Karlsruhe, um, at different personality traits. Um, if a person is more introvert or more extrovert, um, whether this changes um, how they interact with the building. And we found differences um, in behavioral profiles of them, but also in um, profiles, how they um, perceive certain conditions. So um, I'm pretty sure, yes, there will be definitely persons who do not like at all to have to control anything. They would prefer mm -hmm. that we find a way um, to control conditions. Um, they're very relaxed maybe about them. Um, they don't want to interfere with the building, uh, which could be one extreme. Um, and on the other side, there are people who would hate to be controlled um, or who do not like to have experiences outside of they what they would expect um, they're also different personas some which um, i think you can transfer many many things also from outside iq domain um, to look at how um, preferences of per of people um, vary um, for example in adventure seeking some um, for them bungee jumping is kind of boring Others uh, would never do it. I think we, we have the same humans, humans also in the building. And therefore, this topic is so exciting um, and interesting, at least for me from the research perspective. At the same time, also quite complex if you want to design buildings um, and operate buildings which account for all of this. Thank you. That's been absolutely fascinating. And thank you for answering so many questions. I think it's testament to what a rich and interesting discussion that was that we have had so many. Um, so we will try to address those as well. But just before we finish, I'd like to um, remind everybody about what's coming up. So chapter three is the subject of the next webinar. Um, and that's coming up very soon on the 26th of February um, with Clarice Bly de Souza. Now, you should get an email after this webinar, which will give you the sign up links for all of these. So please do um, register for those um, and come along um, to as many as you're able to. We also are running um, another series alongside this, which is on urban building energy modeling. Now moving into a phase where we're focusing on explorations of the tools, their capabilities, some case studies. The next one of those is on the 5th of March with Christoph Reinhardt. Um, and then we have City Sim uh, coming up as well. And you can use the QR codes there to sign up for those two as well. And um, if you miss any of those, but you would like to catch up, the recording for this webinar and for all the other webinars will be on our YouTube channel, which is at IBIPSA University. Um, so do please check it out. There is an absolute wealth of content there as pretty much a full education in building performance simulation um, from absolutely the leading experts around the world, um, which is well worth checking out. And then finally, I know Valentine's Day has passed, but perhaps you forgot it and you're in the doghouse and you need to find a gift for that special someone in your life. Uh, and what could be better 
than an IBIPSA supporting membership. Um, so IBIPSA um, is very much um, a voluntary organisation. You're very welcome to join us without being a supporting member. But the supporting members are fantastic because what they do is they enable us to put on um, events like these webinars and, and many other things. And, and in return, you get uh, a subscription to the Journal of Building Performance Simulation, um, either a print subscription or an online um, access depending which subscription you choose and the right to use um, the IBIPSA supporting member logo. The fees for this remain unchanged for about the last five years, so it's still exceptionally good value. Um, do sign up now before someone notices that um, and changes it. But I think that's really all we've got time for. So thank you once again, Marcel. That was excellent. Um, such an education. Thank you very much. Um, and I do look forward to seeing everybody else uh, back online with Clarice. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Pamela. And thank you all for listening.